Friday the 13th, The Curse of the Jersey Devil, a fan novel by Rashad M. Moore. Chapter 4 Crystal Lake, January 11th. Inside of his old bunkered cabin, there lay stacks of deceased rotting corpses. The smell in the room would be unbearable to most, but to the sackhead assailant, this was the norm. Smells didn't bother him because hygiene had not been something he had indulged in since he was a boy. Besides, the undead cared nothing about hygiene. The smell of Ned Fankelstein's body was starting to reek. His bowel movements with the combination of feces contributed to the excess, bad, hideous smells in the room. His body was tossed in the corner like a bag of dirty laundry and discarded like it was a bag of trash. Jason then went into Ned's pants, pockets, and pulled out his wallet. Inside, it was his identification. Jason pulled it out and tried to read the words on the card. It read, Ned Finkelstein of Weehawken, New Jersey. Jason put the ID in his pockets, walked to the door, and left the cabin. There must be more, he thought to himself. He could feel someone out there. Someone or something was trying to get away from him, and he didn't want to wait around to find out. He thought to himself, kill, 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 die, die, die. The next morning, when Marcus awakened, he woke up with the feeling of excitement and dread. The high levels of testosterone pumping in his blood with the combination of projecting photons from the sun beaming through the blinds of the apartment window and directly into his eyes gave him a sensual feeling that made him relaxed in the morning. When it came to eating, he wasn't much of a breakfast type of person. Most of the time, he would just skip eating in the morning and would often eat two times a day, sometimes only once. When he would choose to eat breakfast in the morning, it would usually be something like oatmeal. He had always liked his oatmeal with butter, cinnamon, and sugar. It was a welcoming taste that almost made him feel childlike when eating it. The smell, texture, and even sound of it, when indulging in its sensation, made him forget, just for a brief moment, that his life was the way that it was. When Marcus was ready to leave the house, he pulled his cell phone out of his pocket and texted Tina Shepard to notify her that he was leaving. He then grabbed both of the two large black duffel bags and proceeded to walk out of the apartment complex. It was around 8.30 in the morning and most of the people who lived in the complex were either still sleeping or had already gone to work. When Marcus got to his motor vehicle, he opened the car door and popped the trunk where he placed the two large bags. In the trunk, he also had survival food, MREs, a large and small flashlight, a fire extinguisher, flares, two spare tires, and a black raincoat. Marcus could never be too prepared, according to him. His car was a black BMW X4. It had a hell of an acceleration and was suitable for Marcus's personality. He stood in front of his car, next to the apartment complex, and took a long gaze at the building. It was a beautiful winter day where the day's forecast was projected to be in the low 30s. Snow had covered the ground and had piled up over the last few days. Later on in the morning, it was forecasted to snow and throughout the week. The temperature was supposed to drop into the teens. However long that it was going to take Marcus to do what he needed, it would have to be done in the frigid weather of New Jersey. He was in no rush to get to his destination, but he also didn't want to take his time. The day had arrived where he would face the fiend. Marcus got into his car and drove off. The trip would only take a little over an hour, but he had to be strategic about his approach. He would have to go into Crystal Lake stealthily. He figured that it would take six hours to get into the camp since he was expecting Jason Voorhees to possibly be watching him as he arrived. Marcus had a method to how he would get into Crystal Lake, and then from there it would set up everything else. But before he would get within range of the camp, he would drive normally. He was now on the way to the lake, but was still in his hometown. He thought to himself to set the mood. He enjoyed quiet mornings and preferred not to speak until the afternoon came. 
He then turned on the radio and tuned the volume up. Marcus enjoyed listening to podcasts because it gave him new perspectives, but this time he wanted to hear music. Jump by Van Halen was playing. Marcus turned up the volume even higher, almost blasting the music to the point where pedestrians started to stare at his car. Jump, Marcus said with enthusiasm. Marcus had always been a fan of 80s rock and metal since he was a kid. He would often listen to the bands Rat, Judas Priest, Guns N' Roses, Scorpion, Black Sabbath, and many others. Growing up, he would sometimes be teased and ridiculed by other kids for the music selection, but that didn't discourage him. Marcus listened to all types of music and would choose the genre that would fit his mood in the moment. Marcus was in the zone, on his way to Camp Crystal Lake. He took a long, deep breath and said out loud to himself, Here we go. The same day, Clearwater, Crystal Lake, three miles from Camp Crystal Lake. Families were pulling into the lake for the annual family reunion. It had been this year's selected location made by the Soli family. Adam Soli, also known as Mr. Soli, had been the one who decided that it was a good idea to host the family reunion at this location. He also considered having the reunion at the nearby Crystal Lake site, but discouraged the idea. He was somewhat aware of the stories of the Crystal Lake Slasher, but just perceived the stories as being urban legends. Mr. Sully wasn't sure exactly why he chose to have his reunion near Crystal Lake. All he knew was that the idea one day spontaneously popped into his head, like an idea that came from the divine. "'It's beautiful, honey,' Mr. Sully said with expression to his wife. Mrs. Sully was also impressed by the pure visual sights on the Crystal Lake grounds. I didn't expect such a lovely sight, Mrs. Sully said. Mr. Sully had brought his family with him, his wife, Mrs. Sully, also known as Lena, his granddaughter Fiona, age 23, his grandson Ezra, age 18, his adopted granddaughter Cassandra, age 28, and Ezra's twin sister Harmony. The parents of the kids were gone out of the country for business reasons and was too busy to attend their family reunion this year. Lisa and Greg Sully had adopted Cassandra when she was 15 years old. By then, their oldest child, Fiona, was 10 years old. Cassandra was of mixed race, half black, half white, but shared more of the black features. Greg and Lisa Sully were two liberal-minded people and had primarily adopted Cassandra to help with their image as a couple. It would prop up their humanitarian image and would discourage the thought that they were a bunch of racists. But the reality of it was they didn't care much for Cassandra. They would mostly just use her as a babysitter since she was older than the rest of the children. There were three other families all around the same size and number than the Soli family. Some of the individuals from the other families were not very friendly with the Solis. They felt that they were shady and fake while mostly only enjoying talking with Cassandra, Fiona, and Harmony. There were also two friends of the family that tagged along with the Solis. Quentin, a guy in his late 40s who was a close friend of Greg, he had been friends with Greg since they were teenagers. Him and Greg were also around the same age. Quentin was a former wise guy. He was from Jersey City and had connections to the Italian Mafia and went off to brag about how he used to shake people down. He had a level of arrogance to him that made him come off as obnoxious, but overall, he was an intelligent guy. His accent was strong a New Jersey Italian accent that resembled that from the stereotypical wise guy movies. Michaela, girlfriend of Fiona, an Australian girl who she met during the first year of grad school at NYU, had also come along to the family reunion. It was her time attending abroad. Fiona and Michaela were lesbians and had been majored in women's studies and considered themselves to be hardcore feminists, though Michaela was the more extreme and radical one out of the two. They had been dating for over a year. They both were the same age and had been dorm mates back at the college on campus. Michaela had invited Fiona to come and visit her family back in Marborn in July. By then, the semester would be over, and they would be able to enjoy their summer together alone. Perhaps some sexy time alone away from the family would do the trick. Fiona spoke to Michaela. Hey babe, you okay? How about later? Michaela replied with a flirty tone. Oh yeah, much later, baby. 
This place is too cold. And there are way too many people here for us to do what we really want to do. But we'll figure it out, mate. Pun intended. At home, Fiona and Michaela would often get in political debates with Ezra over the decisions of the current president. Ezra was only 18, but was bright when it came to political economics. He currently was his high school's class president and was in his last year before graduation. He planned on attending college at Vanderbilt University. He had a bright future ahead of him and aspired to one day own a corporation and eventually become the governor of New Jersey. The debates that he would have with his sister would prepare him for the college liberals that annoyed the shit out of him. He was uh, annoyed by social justice warriors and felt that most of their intentions conflicted with the country. He also had some athletic abilities. He was a part of his school's cross-country team and was ranked first in his district. Ezra shouted across the lake to the other families. Hey, you guys freezing to death yet or is it just me? A male family member yelled back at him and said, No, it's just you. I'm freezing like a shriveled dick over here. Quentin then started talking to Ezra. Yo, Ezra, I'm going to need you to keep your head on a swivel. I don't trust this place. I got a real eerie feeling about this place, man, and I know I ain't the only one. Don't get me wrong. I'm from Jersey, and I'm not a pussy, but this place is kind of fucking creepy. And when I say creepy, I mean weird. I heard a lot of sketchy shit about this lake growing up, but don't get me started on that. It's just odd, you know? Ezra replied. Yeah, I see what you mean. I don't know why Grandpa chose this place to have a family reunion. Why couldn't he choose to do it during the summertime? The weather alone can kill a person. What's so family friendly about this place? The area looks like it barely has modern day technology. Like, what the fuck? The view was nice. You could see the whole lake from every front window angle of the cabins. It was a closed lake that didn't stream out to the ocean like Crystal Lake did. It was in the opposite direction of Camp Crystal Lake, going more inboard towards the other campsites in the area. Some might mistake Lake Clearwater as being the same as one of the Crystal Lake aliases, Clearwaters. You would think that whoever came up with that name would have considered that it was almost the exact same name as this lake's name. At least the name Camp Forest Green had a different ring to it. Forest Green was the name that, that was given to Crystal Lake in the mid-80s to take away the negative stigma of all the killings that had happened in the name of Jason and his mother. Though in 1985, it was a paramedic seeking revenge that was doing the killings. After finding out his son Joey had been viciously killed by a disturbed teenager from the group home where Joey stayed, the copycat killer Roy Burns went on a rampage. Leave me alone, said Vic to Joey at the time. Joey replied back to Vic, and his last words before Vic put the axe in his back was, Well, if that's how you feel, forget it, Vic. Just forget it. But I think you're really out of line. Then followed Joey's death, further enhancing the bloody reputation of Crystal Lake. Roy was a quiet, keep-to-himself kind of guy. The same rage spirits that possessed Jason Voorhees, and the same rage spirits that almost possessed Tommy Jarvis, successfully possessed Vic and Roy Burns. But changing the name of the camp made no difference. People still came to the site and got murdered. So the townspeople figured that they would just change the name back to keep outsiders away. People were going to come to this area regardless if they believed in Jason Voorhees or not. And then you had the type of people who would come to Crystal Lake who wanted an adrenaline rush. I guess the opportunity of the potentiality of them getting killed made them feel more alive. There had also been a family of cannibals that resided around Crystal Lake years ago. A bunch of maniacs. When all the families got out of their vehicles, everyone gathered around and conversated with each other in front of the cabins. Mr. Sully stood at the top of the slope of the hill. He grinned and shook his head in pleasure as he watched the activity of all the families. He waited about 15 minutes and then interrupted. Can I get everybody's attention? Please. He waited a moment and then continued. I am so glad that all the families were able to make it. I know that this year's reunion is a little early and that the location is out of the norm, but be assured that we are here today to reunite as a family, to gather around each other, and realize how thankful we are for having each other. Yes, this year, my family is the 
host for the family reunion, and we have some fun ideas that we have been planning for us to partake in. Ladies and gentlemen and children, enjoy yourselves. We will be making further announcements later on throughout the day. The crowd continued to speak amongst each other, and it appeared that all of the remaining family members had all arrived. It's incredible that so many people agreed to gather during the winter time to this location. Most of the family members went inside the six cabins and decided to predominantly communicate with radios. Out of 36 people, only nine people had radios. I guess they thought that nine people would be enough to manage the whole crowd and... And also, the signal was so bad you'd have to be lucky to get cell phone reception in the area. It's not like Crystal Lake is known for its state-of-the-art, innovative technology. After all, this was the land of old sacred ground where cabins are cemented where there once were pools of blood. Three people stood outside when the rest of the masses went inside the cabin. Mr. Sully, Quentin, and Mrs. Sully stood between the two cabins. There were six inboard cabins that all faced the lake, similar to how a beach house would face the ocean, but just with the cabins closely circling the lake. The lake itself was frozen and was hard enough to go ice skating on top of the water. Mr. and Mrs. Sully were staring out at the lake for a few moments, embracing the elegance of the environment before Quentin asked, So, uh, what made you two old lovebirds decide that it was a romantic idea to have a family reunion at Crystal Lake during the winter time? He said with sarcastic intrigue in his Jersey accent. Quentin had been like a son to Mr. and Mrs. Sully and had grew up with their son throughout his life and had known Greg since he was 13. For one, I just had a feeling like it had chosen me to come here, Mr. Sully coughed and coughed and then continued. And also, me and my wife share childhood memories with the area, Mr. Sully stated clearly to Quentin. Lena then spoke. Yes, we met each other when we were children not too far from here. It was actually in 1955 when that Camp Crystal Lake was actually in operation. I was nine and he was eleven at the time. And if you haven't guessed it by now, me and Adam both attended Camp Crystal Lake. Quentin interrupted by saying, So, let me get this straight. You decided to have a family reunion near Camp Crystal Lake during the winter time, when a blizzard is supposed to pass through this week at the place where urban legend serial killer Jason Voorhees is said to reside. Are you two taking anything that's over the counter? Quentin said with a slight intensity. Mr. Sully moved his head and shoulders with an explanative enthusiasm and said, That's exactly what they are. Urban legends. Superstitions. That's it. I mean, it's possible that Jason could have done some of those killings, but the whole Curse Lake thing is kind of pushing it. It sounds like the economy of this county needs to find better ways of attracting money to this town because this Jason Voorhees shit has gotten way out of hand. Quentin then quickly replied and said out loud, This fucking guy, oh! with this sense of disgust on his face. Sounds like your sanity is an urban legend because you bringing us up here is a real danger. And I only offered to come up to my friend's family reunion, which he isn't here, in order to look after my goddaughter Harmony. That girl is like my own kid, and you two know damn well that I despise the notion of having kids myself. But she is an exception. That's my baby girl. Lena looked at Quentin and stated, Just a few more days here, and we'll be gone and out of this place. You'll be back to riding your motorcycle and eating cannolis in no time. Just look at it as a trip, and that you're a chaperone. Quentin smiled, then walked into one of the cabins. Mr. and Mrs. Sully stayed outside near the lake, gazing at the water. Then a man walked up to Mr. Sully with his left hand out as if he was ready to shake hands. He also had a warming smile on his face. He was a large white man about 6'3 in his mid-40s. Howdy, you must be Mr. Sully. My name is Dave. I'll be your host for the activities at Clearwater for the next few days, Dave said with a Texas accent. Greetings, Dave. Please call me Adam, and this is my wife, Lena. It was my idea to have the family reunion here at Clearwater, but Lena also contributed to the planning of the activities. I'll bet you have some fun and exhilarating events scheduled for tomorrow, Mr. Sully said, smirking. The three stood talking amongst each other for another 20 minutes. Dave then asked, 
So why Clearwater? I heard Crystal Lake is more appealing. Well, I've actually checked it out. It's a beautiful campsite, but the environment is kind of eerie, Mrs. Sully replied. Yeah, we hear that a lot, but it'll grow on you, Dave answered. I hope so, because I ain't used to this cold weather, if you know what I mean, Mr. Sully said. Good old southern boy. I think you'll learn to like the snow. We did. They finished talking, and Dave got into a 1989 silver Camaro and drove off. <laughs> While driving down the road, Dave clicked a button on the comm in his ear and said, The subjects have arrived on target. Standing by for further instructions. It was almost the afternoon, and it had started to snow. Dave had arrived at the lake the night before, but had stayed at a hotel room about 40 minutes away from the campsite. He was traveling back to his room in the hotel. Even though the reunion was based at Clearwater Lake, someone had purchased the land a few years back. Inspector Second Star, Dave Elvis Riker, had known who currently owned the campground. But the county had no idea that the campsite was purchased by an outsider. But if they did, there, were, there would for sure be protest. An authoritative voice spoke to him through the intercom. Second Star Dave Riker, your objective is to keep a low profile with the family and to deceive all who would certainly want to interfere with our operations. Neutralize all potential threats. Dave paused for a moment and then said, I will be interacting with the whole family tomorrow starting at 0800. We will commence in multiple activities to get their family reunion underway. In the meantime, I will deploy the artifact so that I can attract the target. Then the lady said in an authoritative tone, You are expected to comply to all demands while operating in this mission, and you are aware to not return until the job is done. Anything otherwise will be unacceptable. Dave had been a part of the Black Star Shadow government since his early years as a grad student when he was first recruited by them in college. They had been a secret organization that operated in antagonizing supernatural events around the world. Some occultists call them Wolf, Ram, and Hart, while others call them the Directors. They specialize in conducting gathering events that require secret societies to use specialized assassins called Highlanders. The Highlander Project utilized Black Star soldiers of the ranks First Star and Second Star. Once one achieved the rank of third star, there would only be one allowed at that rank. Wolfram and Hart often was the cause of most of the turmoil perpetrated in Sunnydale, California, and in that cabin in the woods in that one state. They would instigate events throughout the country that would cause people to get killed by supernatural entities. This organization were the ones who purchased the land of Crystal Lake recently, so they had the legal rights to combat any type of lawsuits. They would have agents stationed all around the country working as their shadow spies, staying out of the public's attention. Special Agent Riker had worked for the United States branch of the organization and had been promoted from one star to two star in 2012, and was ready to advance in rank. This would be the task that would get him that promotion. I understand, ma'am. I know what's at stake and who I serve. I assure you, Director, I will serve my purpose here. Just give me a chance to show you that I can deliver, ma'am. Over and out. Agent Riker was a very talkative individual, but with his superiors, he had to be conservative and have bearing. Knowing when to speak and when to not speak was vital for his progress. In the trunk of his Camaro was a 13 by 13 inch black box. Agent Riker had been given the box to him by one of his superiors, back in the Upper East Side of Manhattan before he left. He was instructed to not open it until the time came to do so. The time had closely come to fulfilling that plan, and things were about to go down. He was prepared for what would be next. His combat skills were actually pretty decent. He was a constant practitioner of the Krav Maga system, and had utilized his skills in some of his missions. This wouldn't have been the first time that Special Agent Riker would have interacted with the supernatural, but perhaps it would be his most dangerous supernatural that he would have encountered so far. A few years back, he encountered a vicious sea beast the directors call the Merman. The encounter almost killed him. He was bitten on the neck but barely survived. The Merman was one of the fan-favorite executioners in the Black Star program. 
he had faced a different kind of challenge. It reminded him of a time when he was first becoming an agent. He would go to different cities and run into all types of human contractors who directly or indirectly worked for Black Star. Harry D'Amour of New York City and John Winchester of Kansas were two individuals they had been watching under the radar of Wolf Ram and Hart. Riker was not to fail or the consequences would be dire. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 4 of Friday the 13th, The Curse of the Jersey Devil by Rashad M. Moore. You know, it's kind of funny. I've actually been re-watching The Sopranos lately. I'm up to like Season 3, almost Season 4. So, uh, the New Jersey uh, former mafioso was pretty fun to, 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 to do the voice of, i got to admit. Uh, but there's a lot going on. Marcus is on his way out to face Jason and uh, this this secret uh, spy regime is out there setting up, I'm guessing, all these people to become victims of Jason for their own causes. So this is going to be pretty interesting to see what happens. I love the fact that he tied in other Jason films and other horror movies, including Cabin in the Woods. So uh, it's entertaining. Everybody, uh, let Rashad know what you think of the book so far. I know he likes to hear from you all in the comments and reply to you and everything, and I'll be back very soon with more of Curse of the Jersey Devil. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and I'll see you soon.